Welcome to Christ Church. It's the third Sunday of Advent in the most unusual December of my lifetime. Unusual and very challenging. I know you feel that too. So it's good to be connected in this way. I'm very glad to be sharing this time with you. And I hope you will check out what's going on at ChristChurchNYC.online. For instance, if you happen to be watching this video Sunday morning, we're hosting a Christmas carol sing in Central Park today, Sunday, at 2 p.m. Find detailed info at ChristChurchNYC.online, where you can also find out about our virtual Christmas pageant this coming Thursday evening. But now, as, as best we can, let's create a worshipful space in our hearts and minds as we continue our journey towards Bethlehem. Please make use of the program for today's service. You can find below or on the events page of ChristChurchNYC.online. Say the bold text aloud so your own home can hold the sound of God's sanctuary of grace. The promised one of God brings good news to the oppressed and binds up the brokenhearted. We are witnesses to the light of Christ. Rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, holding fast to what is good. We are witnesses to the light of Christ. And now filled with expectation, and questions in our hearts about the new thing God has in store. We join our voices in prayer as we make all things ready for the child of Bethlehem. Holy One, make the doors of our homes wide enough to receive all the goodwill you offer to us in this wondrous season and narrow enough to shut out envy, and pride and strife. Make their thresholds the gateway of your eternal kingdom of grace, and may those who dwell therein joyfully welcome Bethlehem's child, your gracious gift of love. Good friends, let us prepare the way of the Lord, making his path straight filling the valleys and leveling the mountains, making straight the crooked and the rough ways smooth, so that all may see the salvation of God. Amen. The poet Mary Oliver wrote, If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give into it. Life has some possibility left. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Advent is a season of joy and a time of rejoicing because we know that God is not yet finished with us. We are still becoming, and what we are becoming will eventually join with what God is unfolding in our lives, in our city, and in the world. We get to be a part of that marvelous unfolding, and that is a cause for great expectation and great joy. Today we light our third candle, which symbolizes joy. May this flame remind us that whenever God's joy draws near, we are to give into it and let it be our being. Let us pray. God of love, draw near to us and surprise us with joy, a deep joy that transforms our present and our future. Amen.
As we continue in our season of Advent, our focus remains on the new thing God has in store for the world and its inhabitants. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy One, you are our guide and ultimate assurance. By your Spirit, open us to your promises and commands and shower us again with the fire of your love. Amen. The prophet proclaims that as the earth brings forth its shoots, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Isaiah chapter 61 at the first verse. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
God sent John as a witness to the light that was coming to the world. John chapter 1 verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as we await the arrival of God's gift to the world, this Advent is unlike any other in our lifetimes. I think we're facing a dangerous moment in our public life that won't be easily resolved. I'm not referring especially to the hostile partisanship or the politicized pandemic, although those are dangerous enough. I'm referring to something that sits just above these matters in our hierarchy of concern involving a generally agreed upon moral framework in which the pursuit of truth deserves our highest regard. That healthy common life is dependent upon our willingness to humbly submit our opinions and beliefs to an interrogation of truth. And that companion virtues like honesty and integrity, compassion and courage form the strong spine of a person's and a nation's character. This commitment doesn't predict we'll eventually all agree on things like uh, politics and public policy or, or really anything else for that matter, but it does provide the sustaining moral superstructure for the sake of the common good. Sincere Christian faith helps us here in establishing parameters of right and wrong, better and worse, forged on the anvil of love and justice. And that also lie behind Lincoln's famous dictum to listen to the better angels of our nature. Have we lost this common commitment as a first principle, do you think? Do we hold ourselves accountable to these higher values? Is it talked about within your various associations as an important matter? Any organization of which we're a part, be it a friendship or marriage, school or community group, up to and including citizen of a nation, all of these are the sum of what each of us values most. Now, I know well enough through personal trial and error that we live in a morally compromised world. We are regularly left to making choices by the seat of our pants in very questionable circumstances. That's very true. There is no such thing as moral purity beyond a lofty ideal, and even then, discerning the better, nobler way is often searingly difficult when choosing among several bad options. It's hard work, relying on a commitment to what is true, as best we can understand the true. 
Whenever I'm speaking with someone who has chosen badly, there's a tendency for a quick rationalization that sounds something like this. I didn't behave like myself. It, it wasn't me. In response, I might quietly ask, well, who do you suppose it was that made the choice then? Meaning, their logic is a bit faulty. Since they actually did engage the behavior, that must necessarily be an aspect of themselves. The spiritual and psychological work assigned to each of us involves a frank assessment of our actual situation, an assessment of what's true. It wasn't someone else who pulled the trigger, hit the spouse, embezzled the accounts, lied about the affair, raped the co-ed, cheated on the test, or tortured the prisoner. Coming to terms with this is always an aspect of emerging spiritual maturity. This is so for every one of us, every one of us. Step four and five in the anonymous 12-step program's journey into sobriety, health, and wholeness go like this. Step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Step five, admitted to God, ourselves, and another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. This regular moral inventory is useful as individuals and nations alike. For instance, haven't we been sharply reminded in the midst of pandemic that the United States isn't finished with racism? Sharp shards of racism and white privilege haunt the systems of our national character. These are hard truths. But naming what is holds promise for growing into a better version of ourselves. At Christ Church, we say, and I deeply believe, that loving God above all else and my neighbor as myself is the grounding life mission. The sincere desire to do the better thing, taking the more righteous path, guides the intentions of those who would follow after Jesus. And you know, it's always possible to do that. Each one of us is a free moral agent, and each of us chooses the way we will go in every moment of every day, in every circumstance. We do this a hundred times a day in matters small and large. Part of what drives people into a spiritual community is this yearning to be part of something that draws out of us our better, healthier, nobler selves. I feel that within the Christ Church community, sometimes quite powerfully. It's my belief that humans share a latent longing for attaching to something better, something worth a life's desiring, something that matters, something that isn't corrupt, something wholesome, even holy, ennobling and just. This longing lies at the heart of authentic hope for the future. Now, our circumstance is likely not as extreme as that of the ancient Israelites, who had been in exile for decades and were yearning for release and restoration. But Isaiah's word we heard earlier sounds, sounds really fresh and current to this Advent 2020 moment. Remember, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities. For I, the Lord, love justice. Boy, like I said, that sounds real timely today. Now, you know, Jesus identified himself with this text just as he began his ministry. He quoted these very words as a way to explain his purpose. Those who followed his path were also captured by this hopeful aspiration. I really love that description of those God will raise up. Oaks of righteousness. Oaks of righteousness. They used to be those who were oppressed and imprisoned and mourning but they will become oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. You can sense the, the tremendous vitality and strength this image evokes. 
And you can also sense how crucial such oaks of righteousness are to the upbuilding of sustainable human community. Maybe that seems beyond your current aspirational level. Can you see yourself as growing into an oak of righteousness? That is, as someone who aspires to be a builder of something that actually matters, that's generative and adds a net positive to human community, no matter one's background, no matter the personal corruptions and failures in the past we've all had, that's the promise for those who turn towards the light of God's truth and grace. At minimum, this is an astonishing affirmation of human dignity, that God can take a ruined thing and turn it into a flourishing thing. In Christian lingo, we call the goal of this upbuilding the kingdom of God. That's what we're about at Christ Church. That's what our mission to love God and neighbor leads to, citizenship in God's realm. We can't love God and neighbor and not love God's larger purposes, like bringing good news to the oppressed and binding up the brokenhearted and reclaiming liberty to the captives and loving justice the way God loves justice. Doing all of this requires our holding fast to what is true with integrity and compassion and courage. In this way, we too, in our own day, repair the ruined cities. If we take that as metaphor, we could say the ruined cities of our individual lives, the lives of our families and communities and nation. We are builders of the common good that certainly benefits each of us individually, but also anyone who shares our common life, whoever that might be. Inevitably, this impacts the structures of society. How could it be otherwise? The structures of politics and government, business and culture. Imagine our community, our faith community, as a greenhouse for cultivating oaks of righteousness at every stage of maturation. Imagine our children being nurtured with this consciously in mind, that they would become builders of something that actually matters, adding a net positive to the human community, that they came to deeply understand God's interest in human dignity and justice. Considering our children, even the most cynical person can see the common sense logic of this aspiration. What's good for our children is good for the adults and the whole world. But what's the cautionary cliche? The acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. Here's what I say, though. The Christ Church community is intent on raising up oaks of righteousness, just like you, for instance. <laughs> it's wild, I know, I know. Think of it. People who can hear the truth, sometimes the hard truth, and in due course do the more difficult thing. They can, for instance, change their minds, take the hands of those with whom they disagree, even abhor. They can bear one another's burdens, bind up the brokenhearted. They can release the captives and build enduring structures of justice. Honestly, friends, is there anything, anything more important than this today?
morning. My name is Jeff Lieberman. I'm a longtime member of Christ Church. And this morning I'm here to talk about giving. And like most things in 2020, giving is going to be a little bit different this year. We're asking people to do two things. One is to make an annual commitment to the church to support the ongoing operations, our staff, our physical plant, our ministries, our online presence. Number two, though, is we're looking to raise $200,000 for outreach, specifically to support our ministries at El Nido, the Sharing Table, and at the Methodist Home in these times of dire need. You know, as I sit and think about giving, the thoughts of abundance and scarcity come to mind for me. The first time I actually gave anything, really gave something away, was on that pledge card many, many years ago. I didn't grow up giving anything away. That wasn't part of our vernacular or practice in our family. So it was actually really scary for me to make a pledge. But what I've learned over the years, coming to church on Sunday and listening now in Zoom, is that everything I have is a gift of God and it's there to share. Now, as I sit here in the midst of COVID, what's clear to me is that our city is being ravaged. What's clear to me is that the winter that sits in front of us is going to be long and dark and painful. And it's easy on many days to retreat back into my apartment, close the door, zoom away, and ignore the pain and the suffering out there. But when I raise my head up, what I realize and what I see is a woman at the Methodist home, isolated, lonely, and scared. It's a man on my stoop in front of my apartment, homeless, hungry, and also scared. And it's a family at El Nido up in Washington Heights with children, hungry because he lost his job at the restaurant down the street here that closed down. And they're scared beyond belief that they won't have the money to pay next month's rent and they'll be on the street in the midst of all this. So as I think about the pledge and giving that I'm gonna give this year, I'm opening my heart to these around me and I'm praying that I'll do it with full abundance and abandon. And I'm hopeful that you'll do the same. Thank you. Joining the heralds of God's good tidings, let us lift up our voices with strength praying to the one who comforts, restores, and heals. Let us pray for all leaders and people of the world. Holy One, you have created one human family to live in righteousness and peace. Give us the wisdom to order our common life according to your loving purposes, that your glory may be revealed and all people shall see it together. May our president, governor, and mayor serve these purposes with integrity, honoring your desire that justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God of life and light, ignite the fire of your love in our dark world. Let us pray for your church as a hopeful and healing presence. For those who are sick, who suffer need, who are exiled or in danger. You have given us the gift of the Messiah so that your church may be steadfast and true. Give us strength to follow your son until your love has transformed the world. God of light and life, ignite the fire of your love in our dark world. Let us pray for your creation. Maker of all things, your faithfulness springs up from the ground and your goodness looks down from the sky. Rid us of the laziness and greed that diminish life as you teach us to care for your creation together. 
and make us to remember that as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so you will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. God of life and light, ignite the fire of your love in our dark world. Let us pray for ourselves. Loving one, you are present in the pain behind our tears, the laughter in our eyes, the yearning of our hearts. All these you share, yet your gift to us is much more. So open us up, Lord, we whose lives are locked, whose thoughts are well rehearsed, whose prayer is predictable. Open us up to depths we have not explored, truths we have avoided, paths we have not followed, beauty we have to admire. And open us up to Jesus, in whom all things are held together for God and for our good. God of life and light, ignite the fire of your love in our dark world. So let us now share together in our family prayer, the same prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now, sisters and brothers, let us prepare our hearts now to go out into the world and to serve the Lord with gladness as we continue to await in this Advent season the birth of our Savior. Let us share now in the final blessing. Now into your hands we commit ourselves, O Christ, for your holding, your directing, your inspiring, your perfecting. Into your hands we commit ourselves. Bless us with your power to heal, help, liberate, and challenge. Bless us with your yearning for a better world and a fuller faith. Bless us with your Holy Spirit within us and among us. Amen. Amen.